Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Political Paradigm. I'm Victor Mathias. Now, today on the show, I have with us a governorship candidate on the platform of the All Progressive Grand Alliance in the upcoming governorship elect elections taking place on the 11th of November 2023 in Imo State. He is my name, Tony Ejiogu. It's a pleasure to have you join us today oh, on thanks. the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, uh, how do we even kickstart this conversation? Uh, uh, well, so let's even begin by, you know, an assessment of how things are currently, you know, in your state. Well, Victor, um, I'm struggling to find just one word to qualify it, um, but um, very, very bad, very bad. Emo wants the pride of the eastern region uh, of course you know it's called the, East, uh, the eastern headland uh, it's now a battlefield a battleground of uncertainty um, we are being bedeviled with myriad of challenges are you talking about uh, the uh, unprecedented times of uh, uncommon insecurity uh, people are dying every single day Youths are being killed in their numbers. Um, if you go to places like Osu local government... Do you have statistics for all of these things you're saying? Absolutely, they are there. Osu local government, uh, places like Ejeme Kuru, uh, Izombe, Uguta too. I mean, the whole place is, uh, is a pitiable sight to behold. With heavy military presence, houses are burnt down. The insecurity is everywhere in the state. But I'm saying in the part in Osu local government area, that that area is the height of it, you know. Um, there's hopelessness everywhere. Uh, then are you talking about, uh, are you talking about the rise of uh, unemployment in Imo State? At about 56%. Is this from the Bureau of Statistics or that's your from personal the, statistics? No, that's from the MBS, you can check it out. 56%. And that's, that's a recipe for disaster. You know, the economy is run to the ground, it's, it's run aground. We have over about 230 something billion in, in, in total debt of the state. How are we gonna get out of that? And in, in the midst of all this, there are no uh, critical infrastructure that will support sustainable growth and development. Or are you talking about the lack of trust and, uh, uh, between the government and the people? There's so many things that, uh, that are bedeviling the state. And see, Victor, sincerely speaking, our issue in Imo State is a successive um, event of lack of bad, uh, lack of uh, good leadership. Successive. Successive. I wanted, I wanted to just be sure on that. Of, of lack, lack of good leadership. So, so how, how, how back would you want to date this? 1999, when we return to democracy? Uh, yeah, the Fourth Republic, but I wouldn't say uh, the entire Fourth Republic has been bad. Um, I would say from um, 2007, you know, till date, unfortunately. Um, I'm saying this because I think that was the time it became fashionable for a lot of governors uh, to now replace the local government system with sole administrators and all that. So you see a total departure of normal uh, uh, democratic accountability at the local levels. And I think that's where um, things started going bad. But generally, uh, the situation in Imo State is, is very disheartening and it doesn't give any hope uh, for anyone. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's it's, it's sad. But that's the reality. Well, that's your opinion of what things are, you know, in, 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 again, in, in Imo. I'm sure some would have, I mean, it, it's relative and, you know, uh, some might say, you know, things are perhaps different. But, I mean, this, this conversation is ongoing. So let's, mm -hmm. let's begin to pick up some of the things you talked about, you know, debt profile, you know, insecurity, uh, the, the rise of unemployment, you know, which, of course, uh, has led to um, youths being restive and, and, and all of that because, like the saying goes, an idle man is a devil's workshop. Uh, absolutely. So let's begin with um, the creation of jobs. You know, like you said, the statistics according to the NBS, which uh, you know, uh, I would check, um, fifty-six percent. What do you intend to do to drive this down, or even wipe it off completely? Very good question. Um, 
first of all, the situation um, is not totally helpless because we have uh, various, uh, various approaches to, to curbing uh, the high rise of in, in unemployment in the state. If you look at my, uh, my manifesto that have just been released, uh, I have five high points in my manifesto, which is one, carbon insecurity. Second is uh, running a digital economy, you know, and, and I'll tell you how it all ties in together. And also infrastructure and power. And of course, um, the agro resources that we're gonna harness to create an agro revolution. These are gonna provide a lot of opportunities for our younger people to get engaged and meaningful employment. Um, for example, uh, the agro resources, we have, we have a mechanism where we can actually do some smart farming, um, harness some of the agro resources that we have that can cycle out in 90 days and we can do this in three cycles in a year. Of course, that's going to provide security for food and that's going to create um, uh, a lot of ancillary business opportunities in the PVC model that I have, which is primary productivity, uh, value addition, you have to create a value addition uh, a chain, chain, and also uh, employing uh, technology in the use of doing all these things. So if you see uh, in that model, the uh, backward integration and ancillary business impact is going to have in the economy. It's going to create a lot of opportunities. Because in the value chain addition that we, activities that we're talking about, we have um, uh, processing uh, facilities, we have uh, marketing and distribution, all that tied together will create a lot of opportunities for our youth to get engaged and um, be able to thrive you know, in, the, in the state. Yeah, yeah so I mean, you, you clearly, you know, you seem to have, um, what's it called now, like a definitive way in which or part path in which you want to follow Absolutely. to ensure you know uh, um, youths gain employment but it's not about creating the these opportunities how skilled are they to plug in to all of these well let me say this yeah. the job of any governor is not to create jobs it is actually to create the enabling environment for private sector driven economy you understand so Digital economy, how prepared are the youths? I mean, look at it. Our youths are, are technological savvy. Our youths are creative. Our youths are very resilient. So when we talk about creating a digital economy, it's basically what I call the pool empowerment. You know, empowering people, giving them the freedom and opportunity to be able to thrive based on their own talent and God-given abilities. So with our youths being... Uh, Digital penetration in this country is over 70%. You go around, see the business centers, and see what these guys are doing. On the, on the, on the downside of it, you see... 70% uh, in the country. What's the situation in Emo? In, in talking about uh, digital penetration? Digital penetration, yeah. I think it should be more than 70%. But there's a problem, though. We haven't got the infrastructure to open our use to the opportunities to take advantage of the global technology marketplace. And these are part of the things I'm talking about, building the infrastructure the infrastructure is super uh, uh, broadband, laying the fiber optics so that we can have access to real-time global marketplace for these kids. Uh, on, my, on my manifesto, I talked about setting uh, tech hubs, you know, tech hubs in all the three geopolitical, uh, all the three local government areas. Um, senatorial senatorial zones. zones. So that these guys can be trained with the right skill set, with the right... Uh, um, simulation in terms of um, what you call it, um, work, uh, um, sorry. Um, workflow? No, not workflow. Um, oh God, I forgot what they call that. But basically giving them the right opportunity yeah. and training them so they can have the right certifications, like the Cisco certifications and all that, the Scrum Master mm. project management. That way they can compete favorably with their counterparts across the globe. India is doing it. A lot of the people that are employed in India are employed globally. They provide their services. So we have them. We have these guys with the skills, and we can open up the gateway so they can, they, they can match their skill set and offer it for, for service to the world and in exchange for foreign exchange. That way they can, they can be gainfully employed, sitting right there in a worry mm. without moving anywhere else. 
people are doing it. We are doing it currently in Lagos. I have, I sit on the board of uh, Vimos Technologies and we are providing opportunities for our people to work in Lagos where supporting some of the contracts that we have overseas. And these are some of the ways I think the, the burden of uh, unemployment can be lifted off of the, uh, the state government. We can't assimilate all the uh, employable youths in the, in in the, the civil, civil service commission. Service, yeah. it's, it's, it's just not feasible. But we can create the opportunity with the right investment hmm. in infrastructure so that these guys can get employed uh, on their own. And for those that are not technologically uh, inclined, well, in the school curriculum, you can tweak it so that we can focus mainly on um, uh, vocational uh, studies and for uh, self-reliance when they come out of school. And the government can also support them uh, in uh, SMEs, support them with soft loans and, and guidance, entrepreneurial uh, mentorship and all that, so they can stand on their own with the government support. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's good you made mention of you know, tweaking the education curriculum because uh, this debates as to what people should be doing or what you know, the upcoming should be doing. Uh, should they focus on nano degrees, you know, where, you know, they get their certification, six months, like you said, Agile, Scrum Master, you know, Cisco, and all of these nano uh, degrees that would give you gainful employment, you know, after you're done with it? Or, you know, first of all, focus on the current curriculum we have, which is the 6334, and, you know, uh, then you get your nano. But others are of, of the opinion that you can actually merge them together. But... What would you advise? Well, we're not going to completely eradicate conventional uh, um, curriculum. Uh, curriculum. That's fine. I mean, you, you need that as well. But there are people who are more inclined um, uh, with normal vocational stuff and uh, artisans and all those things. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, a young boy graduated from school over five years ago. He hasn't got anything to do and you're waiting for the government to provide job. And there are no jobs. But somehow he finds his way out of the shores of this country. He has a degree probably in engineering, right? What happens? They quickly go down there and uh, perhaps uh, take some certification courses or uh, LPN courses and become a nurse, right? You become a nurse and they're earning a living there. So if we can quickly do that when we leave the shores of this country, then why don't we also think of ways to um, so be, sustain ourselves through certification courses, you're talking about Scrum Master, project management, Agile and all those things, you can do that. And of course online there are opportunities uh, with uh, uh, some uh, sites like Upwork and all that where you can actually get engaged. So what we, the model that we are proposing is to be able to train this, uh, these, these youths in the areas that they have a flair for train them and be able to absorb them into the system. How? They can also provide local services. We're going to headhunt them to different companies globally as well. You understand? We can do that. And that way, they can remain in Imo State, gainfully employed. It could be customer service. It could be, uh, um, uh, like you call it, agile. It could be scrum master. It could be anything. But we have the infrastructure in place to be able to make sure that we open up the global digital marketplace for them to compete favorably with their counterparts overseas. Absolutely. Uh, let's hope uh, that comes to pass. But, but you know, in, in all of this, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, you know, the, you want them to gain all of this knowledge so they can compete on a, on a global scale and remain, you know, within the geographical, uh, uh, what is it called now, uh, the geographical space. region, yeah, space, you know, of Emo State. But, I mean... The picture you painted, which again, like I said, your opinion, um, it doesn't really favor a lot of people to stay back and, you know, thrive, you know, be it in Imo or in Oweri, in Ohlu, in, in all of the places you made mention of. So, which means security needs to be taken care of. Absolutely. What is your plan in that respect? <sighs> Victor, um... Security is a ser very serious challenge. And um, before you can profile a solution to anything, you have to understand the root cause of that problem. This is a hydra-headed uh, challenge that we're facing, and there are no one-stop one shop for it. For me, I want to take a different approach. I want us to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, how did we get here in the first place? 
where did we drop the ball? Perhaps when we ask those questions and get those answers, we can begin the process, the actual process of addressing those issues. I remember when I was in the United States, I, so I was hearing about Ken Sorowiwa. Ken Sorowiwa was an activist, right, in the Niger Delta area. And he was, he was talking about how the IOCs, the international oil companies, were just polluting the Niger Delta waters. And nobody paid him any mind. Sooner or later, he was silenced. The rest is history, you know it. But what happened? The whole place was devastated. They couldn't farm. They couldn't gain any, anything to do, in the, which is fishing and all that. That grew restive youths. The frustration, the frustration grew. And before you know it, the militants, they came on. So it's important for us to look back and see where did we get it wrong? so that we can properly address these issues. You understand? Until we do that, we can't profess solutions. In this instance, where did Imo get it wrong? Well, um, <laughs> like I said, you know, this Fort Republic started in 1999. By 2007, um, that was after the tenure of our former governor, uh, Achiku Udengwa. After that, the local government system was completely eradicated, as far as I know. Because before then... Uh, yeah, no, we still have the local government system. What do you mean by eradicated? Well, what I'm saying is this. Before 2007, we had local government systems that were functional. You had local government chairmen, you had councillors. So it's like a self rule duplicating everything that happened on the state level here. It brought government closer to the people. It brought development to the grassroots. People felt they had a stake in the government. You don't have to run to the state. By 2007, it became fashionable to call it sole administrations. There were no councillors. So everybody now looked up to the centre to make a buck or two. And then you now look at the, the state politics. Uh, a lot of political magic began to happen there. So it totally took people away from government coming close to them. It, it just reminds me of uh, the colonial times, the colonial days, when the colonial masters imposed Warren chiefs on the people and the collapse of the Warren chiefs. The people rejected them, right? So the people want to be part of the government. The people want to feel that they choose you to rule them. And that way there are no incentives for rebellion. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think with the local government system, completely dead, that's the third tier level of government that should be um, uh, 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 the, the level of government that brings development to the grassroots. That's why it was created in the first place. Now it's completely eradicated. That's what I mean by that. So what happens? The little contracts that so, go so, so no local government elections, it's just... Uh, no local government elections. It's just I mean, the governor I, who decides who runs the local government. That, that, that's, that's the reality on ground. I remember when President Buhari was uh, addressing the governors agitating for state police. And he said, how could you be agit agitating for state police when you could not even conduct a simple local government election? How can you even fund the police when you can't even pay minimum wage salary? So you see, we have a critical uh, uh, challenge on our hands and we have to go back to the drawing board and figure out exactly where we missed it. Hmm. So, 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 you know, um, he also made mention of the debt profile of the, of the states. Um, so you, you have to be looking at things that would drive um, IGR now, internally generated revenue, um, you know, FDIs and, and, and all of that. What would you be doing differently? Um, what would you be looking at that would drive, you know, the inflow of even FX, not just Naira, I mean, you know, that would be able to service your debts, you know, to that, at that level and even have enough, you know, to improve the infrastructure, you know, and all of the things that you, you, you're talking about that you want to do, how do you want to change the fortunes of the state's IGR? It's very simple, uh, very, very simple, Victor. Like I said, one thing that would um, create jobs and stimulate the economy is to set policies that would make sure that the private sector is working. Those I call the microeconomic engines because it is the private sector that creates the job. 
it is the private sector that makes the economy boom. America runs on private sector. So once you create the policies and make the policies favorable for businesses to thrive, that means making the right partnership in terms of investments. That's going to grow the IGR. Of course, I mean, you can't forget our diaspora base as well, because they have a lot of role to play as well in terms of, you know, bringing back investments. And no investment thrives in an unsafe environment. Absolutely. So we have to tackle the security issue sincerely and objectively. Mm. You know, uh, I'm not saying that there are no solutions to it. There are solutions to it, of course. You can talk about deploying technology to make sure that crime is prevented and all that. But you can also look at who are these bad actors? What are the grievances? Can we come to the table and dialogue? And sincerely, too. So it ties down to what I was talking about. Not just about. dialogue, sincerely. Sincerely, too. Because that's the mistrust between the government and the people. You see all this happening all the time with NLC going on strike. Because when you dialogue and you come to a truce, you're an egg at, at some point. They don't trust you anymore. So we have to come to that table. There are perpetrators of these criminalities that are just victims of circumstance. Do you understand? So, and there are people that are just bad actors and it's in their DNA. We have to figure this, all these things out. And that's why victims of circumstance would have to uh, be treated leniently. You know, if you talk about my, social, my institutional reforms, I'm talking about prison reforms and all those things. You don't, you don't take a hardcore criminal, criminal and put him in the same penitentiary or prison with a first offender. So we have to allow these correctional facilities to, there, to, to exist so they can go down there and get reformed and also be integrated into the society. So these are the issues um, we, have, we have to look at in terms of making sure that we create a safe environment. And then with that, economy will thrive. Private sector driven economy is my, my, my main thing. And it's having the right partnerships, right opportunities, right investment with mega resources so that you can make the right investments. For me, thank God, the um, uh, power generation has been removed from the exclusive list. So you can actually generate your own power. We're looking at doing that at Demo State. We're looking at doing that in compliance with the global uh, climate change uh, uh, um, policies, mm. especially with um, green renewable energy. So we can reduce uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gas and uh, promote zero uh, CO2 emission. We can do that. If you're talking about the uh, fossil fuel, we have gas. So when you do this and you bring, you build uh, uh, m uh, small captive power plants, whether it's renewable energy, energy power plants, waste to energy power plants, and you build them across industrial clusters, right? I keep saying this, the backward integration business impact that this can create, uh, you can sell the power. The cost of a uh, uh, kilowatt of power is running up almost 100 naira per kilowatt, right? If you're retailing this power, if you're trucking the gas from Ohaje mm. to to Oweri metropolitan area, these are services that are going to be created and people are going to be running the services. Automatically, you're creating jobs. jobs. And you have constant power supply. Guess what? Of course, you can now lay the fiber optics, right? And then you can have you can open up the gateway. And a small boy that is in the village that is uh, running a barber shop will not have to now go buy fuel to keep powering the small generator. generator. And of course, that's going to up the price of his service. So it ties in, to, uh, ties in together. But create a safe, livable uh, community. Investments will thrive, make the right investments, and then create the right policies for private sector to thrive. That's it. Well, uh, um, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, what would pretty much, you know, drive all of this, you know, once there's a safe environment. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Said, but let's take a look into you. I mean, let's look at your background. What have you been doing before this, this period? Well, i um, been running my private business. I, I am a financial consultant um, since I came back from the United States. Um, well, I had a little brief outing politically with this um, Ikedi or Hakim administration. And after that, I uh, went back to Lagos and started running my consultancy firm, um, which I'm still running until date. Um, well, I have other business interests as well, like I said. Um, I sit on the board of uh, a company called Vimos Technologies. We provide technology services, and this is what we're doing. Also, providing opportunities 
for uh, young, brilliant uh, technology savvy individuals to be here and manage projects in the United States and being paid in foreign currency yeah. because the contracts are in foreign currency. Mm -hmm. And we can replicate the same thing in Nemo State. I'll give you one little idea. Um, if you, I bank with Standard Chartered Bank, right? And the customer service of Standard Chartered Bank is in India. No need to mention names. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if you call the customer service of a good bank, maybe it, 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 route, it routes to India and they're picking up the calls there. They're providing services. So we can do the same thing. We've got very brilliant uh, people in, in, in Emo State with, at least we don't even have very thick accent like the Indians do. So we can run a call center. For example, if I get a, con if I get a contract from uh, Visa or MasterCard or whatever to run 300 lines in Emo State, 24 hours a day. If we just take $10 an hour for that, 300 lines automatically gives you 900 jobs because it's a three shift, 300, 300, 300. That has automatically created 900 jobs for our youth right there in Emo State, sitting right there without burden on the state government. And the state government can even actually take taxes on those monies. So automatically, you're creating a robust economy. You're creating a middle class, and they have hope. They can sit in Emo. You create a, uh, an industrial cluster in Emo State, 24-hour power supply, everything is there. Industries will come there and site. We give them tax incentives and all that. They create employment for our people. So they, the opportunities are limitless for our people. We just need um, visionary leaders that think out of the box, think out of the metrics, that have the genuine um, interest of the people at heart. Like I said, you know, ours has been a case of having a fertile ground and we keep injecting bad soil. We've always had square pegs and round holes. You understand? And that's the challenge that we're having. So we need to go back and reset the whole thing. So if we can, um, if we can do things right differently, we can't keep doing the same thing repeatedly and expect a different result. Results, no. yeah. So we need to have visionary. And that's why I'm sitting here today. That's why I'm presenting myself you know, uh, for this service, for mm. this, for, for, for this uh, uh, noble cause. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so, you know, uh, this, this word, you know, which, well, this phrase, so to speak now, you know, that has been, uh, that is very prominent now is, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, especially uh, the social media folks, they say show workings. Uh, you know, why I asked about what you used to do, you know, before now, mm. is, you know, in all of your past and your previous work as, cons as consultant, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, and, and all the things you made mention of, uh, what impacts did you make to the youth of emo states that would make them entrust their government to you? Good. You see, um, Victor, some people play to the gallery, and some people are very silent and um, achievers. In my own little capacity, I have been involved in a lot of philanthropic work. Apart from that, I just told you, we have an office in Lekki, and this is what we're doing. I'm not telling you what I don't know. I'm telling you what we do. Oh, yeah, Currently, I, I, I would right? have expected that you know, your, your office in Lekki has a branch in Owe. Yeah, well, we had a branch in Owe. Actually, where my campaign office is right now is, used to be our office. When the kidnapping and everything started, we moved to, to, to Lagos. So to tell you, you see, all these things also take businesses away. You see a lot of brain drain, opportunity drain because of insecurity. But apart from that, anyway, that is relative. Yeah, apart from that, anyway. So I have been doing this. You know, I I also uh, consult for a lot of companies. Uh, a lot of these ideas that I have are my ideas originally in the course of my business transactions. Um, so it's it's, it's um, is what I know that would work, that has worked in other parts of the world, that has lifted people, young men and women out of poverty, that we will, will implement here. And what is important in this whole thing is a call to service is, is, it requires a lot of sacrifice and commitment. It requires competence, which I do have. It requires the, the knowledge. It requires the experience. It requires the exposure. Most of all, it requires the character and the will to be able to do the right thing. And that is the critical thing that we lack in our leaders. So I think with every sense of humility and modesty, I possess all that. And that is why 
uh, I am presenting myself because I have a track record of doing this. I have a track record of raising funds. I have a track record of um, using what I call alternative financing mechanism to be able to uh, generate funds. These are things that most of these other people don't know about. We do it. You know, we, I, uh, my brother and I, I just helped to um, get one of the companies on the uh, stock market. My specialization is in the OTC market. And uh, the stock is worth over $70 million as we speak. How did we do that? Our specialty is in getting the pro prospectus to the capital market done and making sure that the right moves are made and the stock goes up and that's it. There are ways you can finance or you can raise money. One is to continue to tax and over uh, uh, lethargic people already that are, are already tired or debt financing which is killing us already or the capital market and we are specialized in that area to be able to generate funds that we can help offset some of our bills, um, pay off and make the right investments and let the people's money work for us. That's the most important thing. It's important to do Yeah, that. let the people's money work, uh, you know, for you. So let, let's look at your emergence, you know, uh, as, as a candidate. Yeah. Uh, some believe that there was some form of uh, change in the list of delegates, you know, before the elections, before the primary elections uh, were held. Mm. Uh, you know, so they still believe that, you know, the candidate, even the process that didn't bring you as a candidate, you know, had a little bit of a um, uh, uh, here and there. I mean, uh, what's your response to that? I, and have you reconciled with the candidate? Is she supporting you? <laughs> There's absolutely nothing like that. Uh, I tell you what happened. Um, let, it, let me say this. I have been a member of the party for since 2018, uh, though passively. And um, fortunately, uh, the Labour Party thing happened to Nigeria, which is good. The Labour movement. Yeah, the Labour movement, which is good. Yeah. It created a lot of distraction uh, for, for people that are looking to ride on the wings of something that has already been built. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it, it didn't faze me. I remained in APCA because I believe that APCA is the only political platform that gives a voice to Ndibo as a people. And if you look back before the war, uh, pre-Biafran uh, uh, war, the southeastern region was growing at an average rate of 9% per annum, estimated to be the fastest growing economy in the world. The war struck, truncated the whole developmental plan. Now, this is where we are. As in the war, we must look within to rebuild. So I have always been a proponent of APGA. I believe that that is a party for the peasant farmers, for the common man, you know, and also for the progressive-minded people like a young youth like myself. So I remain there because I believe in the Igbo agenda. I believe in building uh, from scratch. So when everybody left for Labour Party, I remained. But I started preaching my message. I started pre pre preaching my principles and, and, and my ideology to, to our people, to the party members. Mm. And um, uh, time came, we didn't have any candidate for Guba. We had a couple of aspirants, but they didn't, um, they didn't uh, come forth to, to actually purchase the form. Well, before I did, a certain lady actually did come forth purchased the form. Rumor had it that she was not a member of the party and we had it on good authority that she hadn't, hadn't actually resigned from uh, APC, you understand, before she bought the form and actually wrote for a waiver, you know. So, but when I, when I came on board and um, expressed my interest and bought the form, um, I believe um, the party leadership uh, deemed it fit to um, not approve her waiver. That was how she was disqualified. So I remained the only candidate that ran for the primaries, and there was no, there was no issues. I was just returned uh, unanimously and uh, by affirmation, and uh, that, that's it. So you, 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 there was actually a primary election? Absolutely, yes. Well, um, again, Absolutely. <laughs> again uh, that, that's still out there, and uh, 
Hopefully, you know, we don't see we don't see legal fireworks no, like no, I've no, seen no, in other parties. No, no, you know, heading. Let me heading, say this. Let me say the, this, Victor. Abga, Abga remains the only political party in the upcoming election in Imo State that has a clean bill of health. We have no litigation whatsoever. Absolutely, I am the candidate of the party. Hmm. Yes, um, the the primary is because the, the the lady you referred to actually uh, uh, protested. Oh, my name should have been there, but I mean that's, that's the labor process. You ask for a waiver, and the party, in his and their wisdom, decided to decline that waiver. So, statutorily, there's nothing to you can't you can't fight over nothing. And uh, today, Tony Ejogo remains the only candidate. Were you behind the party not approving her waiver? Uh, no, I, I, I mean I, I didn't write the application for the waiver, so why would I be behind it? Absolutely, I had no hand in it. Well, let's, let's look at it now on a general scale because mm -hmm. uh, you're coming up against an incumbent, you're coming up against, you know, the Labour Party, which, like True. you said, mm -hmm. you know, has a movement going for it. Yeah. Uh, not forgetting also the People's Democratic Party who won the election, you know, uh, previously, but were sacked uh, 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 by the courts. Mm -hmm. These are, how would I put it now, uh, uh, big wigs in the political space in Imo states. Mm -hmm. How do you, what do you think your chances are? you know, coming up against all of these people? Mm. Well, I think, Victor, I think, I think the question should be what are their chances against, up, uh, against the people, not me? Um, you just talked about my emergence in Abga. It speaks to, 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 to the people's resolve and um, willingness and uh, uh, desire to sign a new social contract a social contract that will issue in a new dawn to begin the process of rebuilding Imo State. You know, people are desirous of that. A, a social contract that will issue in a new dawn of seventh leadership, which is what I represent. A social contract that will issue in a new dawn that would also uh, uh, rebuild the confidence and the trust between the people and the government. That is what it is. So my emergence speaks to that and speaks to people's desire for a change. Things are not the way they used to be, and let's, let's, let's be realistic about it. And what, what the youth are clamoring for now, what everybody is uh, desirous of now, is to have uh, a fresh breath of uh, new ideas and initiative that will set and propel our state on a new trajectory of peace, prosperity, and, uh, and growth. These uh, former administrations, they, they, they haven't given that. And if I can say it has been a successful failure, if I can use that oxymoron, and that is the real fact. So now you're talking about my, how do I stand up against them? Well, it's how do they stand up against the people? Because the people want a change. And I represent that change that the people want. The people want someone that is empathetic to their plight, someone that can listen to them, someone who's an ordinary person like them. Someone who has been through the, the pains and the, 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 the trauma that they, they've also been through. I'm a product of the diaspora. I've been back since 2008. I hadn't gone back. Some people will come back and, and, and go back on a second missionary journey, which they never return, right? But I have been here. So I understand the pains of coming back with good, sound education, with all the global contacts and, uh, uh, and uh, good pedigree and the knowledge and everything. But still, the system is so, uh, <laughs> so difficult that you, you find a way to make it. Then I think about those that didn't have the same opportunity. So that is why I remain here, to make, to make things better, to walk towards this point where I am today, to give hope to young men and women that are aspiring uh, to make something out of their life. So I think I, I represent that beacon of hope for the new generation. I am about the youngest uh, running for, for, the, for, the uh, office. for the office. Mm -hmm. And ABGA is um, one of the major political parties. And I, to be honest with you, I stand a, a better chance than all of them. Well, you talked about Labour Party with a lot of, with a lot of lit litigation. You talked about PDP, which uh, is basically toxic to a lot of people. You talk about APC, the incumbent, yes, well, um, he's done his beat in a couple of areas and all that, but people want to change. The place is not safe. Our young men are dying every day. They have 
left the state. We have brain drain. It's not this Japa syndrome thing that you're talking about. It's also a function of the insecurity. There are no opportunities. People are frustrated. People are. That's what you see. That's the, what is bringing out this. Uh, this, yeah. this Mr. Jogo, the, yeah. the, the irony of all of this, especially talking about you know the, the people or the other candidates being up against uh, the people, is that mm. when rallies are being held, yeah, you would see that every political party, including the incumbent, having a a filled space. Mm which means the, 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 the are in line with what the candidate, you know, is selling. Not necessarily. Oh, well, so why are they there? I mean, why do you usually have a lot of people, you know, during campaigns at campaign grounds? Why, why is it always the same crowd? I mean, the same number of people. Mm. We've seen this over and over again in past elections. Mm. Uh, Victor, you, you, you talk as if you're not a Nigerian. You, you, you understand that you can rent crowd, right? I was just talking to a friend of mine. He said, we have an uncle that uh, left the United States since 1970-something. He hasn't come home, but now he's dead. They brought his cop back, you know. Uh, you know what? It's a merriment thing for all of us. He never came back home. So we had to go to a corner war and hire a lot of uh, professional mourners. <laughs> you know, so anytime you have a rally... And you have. I mean, I'm not in the political space, so no, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know that no, no, this is any, what actually goes any, on. Anytime you have a rally, yeah. right, and, and, and you have something to share, people are going to come. The, 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 the number of crowd you have there is not, uh, is, is, is not uh, an affirmation of the people's willingness or an affirmation of the people's uh, um, endorsement of that particular candidate. No, it, it's not. It's not. Because you can actually hire the crowd. Uh, we saw during the campaign, this during the last presidential campaign, some people dressed as bishops and all those things. <laughs> does, that mean, does that mean they were actual bishops? So the, the, this is the reality on ground. Um, but what is important is, you know, um, to realize that um, the land is not safe. And a lot of people are living under fear. And a lot of people um, want a change. They desire something new. But they are helpless. Uh, they feel uh, emasculated, you know. So they need some sort of um, hope. They need real hope. They need people, someone that can give them that beacon of hope. They need to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And this is what someone like me represents. This is what Abga represents, at least for us, for Ndibo, for Ndimo. It's a, it's a very clear credible alternative to what we are having right now. So if I told you now that, oh, Victor, I, I would like to perform surgery on you, oh, of course you will say no, because I haven't got the expertise, I haven't got the knowledge to do that. So why do we keep allowing people that have no business in administration and governance to be there? That's that, relative again. Some, that's, would, but some would say they actually do. Well, uh, I, 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 beg, I, 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 beg, I beg to differ. Which is allowed, it's your opinion. Yeah, it's my opinion. <laughs> but uh, sincerely, that's, that's, the, that's the real... That's, that's, that's yeah, the truth. still speaking of, you know, crowds having, you know, mm. you know those large crowds, you know, during rallies. Mm. Uh, what's your take on money, on money politics? Because like you said, if you have something to give, a lot of people will actually come, you know, for your rallies. You know, how do you intend to... I mean, is this a trend that would just continue? Or is it a, a trend that at a point would have to stop this this issue of having to give money or having to pay someone, you know, to wear your, your, your campaign uh, uh, regalia, so to speak, now? The emergence of Peter Obi into the political space has enlivened the consciousness of the average youth, has given us hope that there could be a better Nigeria, has also completely challenged the status quo. And look, it was his emergence that gave me the impetus, the audacity to dream, to believe that it could be possible. And if you are a builder, if you are a critical thinker, and if you're one that sees, uh, has a visionaire that doesn't follow the crowd, then you tap into that. So, and this, this, was, this was part of my, my philosophy, this was part of my message to Abga to our party people, look, we must stop 
this money back politics. We must stop it. This was what killed the party in 2019. But it hasn't gotten us anywhere. So people must be allowed to vote their conscience. The 5,000 Naira you collect today is, is, is not going to, uh, uh, it can't carry you about too far. Maybe one day or two days and that's it. You've mortgaged your future. So I kept preaching this eradication of money back politics, especially in Abga, because we have tried it and it hasn't worked. It has almost put the party in a commercial state. So because of that, we must try something totally different. And the people believed me and it has worked. I am the flag bearer of the party. So we are now trying to rise out of the ashes of what happened to us in 2019. And you can see where we are because we didn't believe in money back politics. I didn't, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a private uh, individual. I do my private business. I don't have the, the war chest that the rest of them have never benefited from government patronage. So why would I throw money? It's, it's about your vision. It's about your message that resonates with the people. It's about what you want to do for the people. It's about relating with the people and empathizing with them and having what it takes to be able to actually get the job done in the first place and the willpower to do them and the character and the pedigree to do it. Uh, a lot of these people that we have parodying themselves as leaders uh, have questionable character. Why do we keep doing, going that route? Money doesn't change things. It's the vision that rules the world. You look at our, across the world, look at what is happening. I just told you back room there that I, a friend of mine, um, the young chap that I went to university uh, with, is now the governor of Maryland. He's a black guy, right? So the world is going towards that direction. Is, 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 is vision that rules the world. It's not, about, it's not the money. You might have all the money, but guess what? It's a business transaction that they're doing. If I come to the party and I throw billions into the party and I buy cars and I do this and I do that, what is it? I, I'm trying to buy them. And then when you get in there, what happens? You want to recoup your money. And the people have already mortgaged their future. Have you ever heard of Stobak infrastructure? Yes, I have. How do we change again? Still, you know, boiling down to, you know, talking about money politics. Well, this program, incidentally, is called Political Paradigm. It's having, it's having, um, it's having a message that will resonate with people, that will cause a paradigm shift in the uh, culture of governance that they used to. Um, stomach infrastructure and the hardship that we think we see are imaginary. I mean, people are hungry. People are, yeah. people are people, even the minimum wage, like you said. Uh, the former president was telling governors they can't afford to pay the minimum wage. So, mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, I mean, even according to UN, you know, a lot of people are living below, you know, one dollar a day. So, but our people are very how imaginary? How imaginary is this? Well, uh, there's a saying in my place that um, um, you can be well fed and you can be um, content. Right? There's a difference. Explain. Explain. I'm well fed right now. Maybe I, I, I go to a party and I eat. I'm okay for now. Tomorrow I will be hungry. Hmm? But being content is a state of mind. It's a state of being. Regardless whether you eat or not, you're okay. You're content with what you have. I say a lot of this hardship is imaginary. Because you see a young boy that is willing to uh, uh, do what they call Yahoo Yahoo just to uh, uh, make a buck or two. In doing that, you have also uh, signed up for something else that you don't even know. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of all that is imaginary because it's not what is going to keep you. What do they want to do with that? Just flamboyant lifestyle in a couple of years is gone. So it brings me back to when I say we have to go back to the drawing board, our value system. We need to go back to our value system. And the church has a lot of role to play in this. A good gov uh, government has a lot of role to have to be the bulwark of this revolution that we're talking about. It's a mindset thing. When you talk to people and relate with people, uh, yes, people are hungry, but our people are so resilient. They can find one thing or the other to, to do to at least keep going. But once you bring greed 
into it. Once you bring uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, covetousness into it, it's a problem. Then you go the extra mile to do a lot of uh, unheard of things just to make money. And we have to go back to our value systems. We have to inculcate those values, those principles in our kids. I went to a function some time ago, a children's function in the school. And the children were performing on the stage. And the parents came in uh, what we call spraying, spraying all the kids. All the kids that got the money, at the end of the presentation, they left the stage happily. The ones that didn't get the money stood there crying. Some parents and the teachers had to come and plead with them to get off the stage. That's the power of money. That's the mentality. That's the culture. That's the, 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 the mindset that we, we now have. Those children on the stage, they now want money to be sprayed on them. And if they didn't get it, it affects their, uh, psyche. their psyche. And they're there crying. You understand? You see all these things happening. People are willing to... Uh, sell their, their, their brothers or their friends or kidnap just to make money. Come on. We, we missed it somewhere. This get rich quick thing. I think we should go back to our, our, our basics. Where did we go wrong? Get back these values into these kids. Let us appreciate hard work and this a, 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 a meritocratic system where you come out of university with a 2-1, you, you, you're sure that you will get unemployment. And no, no, the, the person with a third tier, uh, sorry, not tier, tier, third, third class. class, they call it here, or, or pass. would not have an upper hand over you. A system where the son of a nobody can become somebody without knowing someone. A system that works. These are some of the things I have on my manifesto, social and institutional reform. We must go back to the basics and bring back the values uh, incidentally, I'm a product of the seminary school. So I think we missed it somewhere. Value system was either the church also must play a role in this. You go to the church after praying. The next thing, oh, people that want special prayer, come, 50,000 naira. Why? Are you saying this is happening in this country? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's happening everywhere. I mean, the, the, the church has been commercialized. Well, let, let's let's leave the church now. Let's, uh, let's look no. at let's look at other institutions that yeah. you know uh, make up this whole process. Mm. Uh, one of which is the Independent National Electoral Commission (INEC). Mm. Um, how confident are you in the ability of INEC to conduct a free, fair, and a credible election come 11 11 2023? Well, I, I must commend INEC in um, the the job they've done so far. Um, well, especially with uh, introduction of the um, uh, beavers and the IRIV technology into the, the whole process. Yeah. Um, it's still a work in progress, you know. Um, and w while we await the outcome of uh, the, um, uh, the judiciary on this uh, outstanding cases and all that. But, you know, Rome was not built in a day. Uh, we are making good strides uh, towards um, having a, a true independent electoral system uh, and um, we must commend them it's not easy really because we have a lot of uh, factors that also impede and, and them discharging their, their their duties especially in certain places you know look at it, in Imo state in certain places they, they are even afraid to go there and uh, and work because of their lives they are also human beings you know so um, for the most part they have done well. Yeah. Uh, good initiative, IREV and Beavers and all that. It's now uh, the next stage, yeah. uh, making sure that it's actually uh, utilized and implemented mm. uh, so that the voice of the people can be heard. What about the judiciary? Uh, so, Quickly, as we wind this conversation down. Yeah, judiciary, um, thumbs up to them so far. Uh, they have... Um, they have to prove themselves now at this point in time as we are at this critical crossroad. Um, uh, so, is, is, uh, the, the, like they said, the judiciary is the last hope of the common man. And uh, we, I'm, I'm using this opportunity also to uh, plead with them to not to let the people down. Do what is right. Let the citadel, citadel of justice, you know, remain what it is. You know, anyone that comes for 
equity must come with clean hands. Clean hands. And um, that is what we are looking up to the judiciary to help make this system work. All right. Very well. Uh, we pray that the system will work and, you know, we'll get the desired results at the tail end. But uh, the final word now, if sure. the election doesn't go your way, uh, would you be heading to the courts? Uh, <laughs> well, Victor, look, I, I can't say yes, I can't say no. Um, what we don't want is injustice. Injustice in the sense that um, our voices are not heard, uh, uh, people are disenfranchised, and, and uh, people are fraught with a lot of aggressive violence. We don't want that. Mm. We want free and fair election where people can come out and vote. And I must say this to our people in Demo. You know, the people constitute a great deal of security. When our people rise up and say enough is enough, then enough will be enough. I, I watched a, a documentary sometime about uh, the Romanian revolution, Nikolai Ceausescu, you know, and how the people decided, no, it's enough, and does it. So our people must stand up and do what is right. Our people must come together and form that security that uh, um, would also uh, become a defensive violence, basically, you know, so that our voices will be heard. It is our state, it is our country, we must exercise our franchise with our fear of favor, and we must allow our voices to be heard. The people must hold leaders accountable. A leader is not going to hold himself accountable, and this is one of the things I'm working on, I'm, I'm running on, a culture of anchored on, a uh, system anchored on transparency accountability mm. and responsibility well let's hope that uh you know when the time comes uh, these promises you've made are promises that you would keep you know from a to to to, to z Indeed, pretty much you know that. to the letter yeah. uh, but obviously thank you for joining us on the show thank you. and of course we wish you um, all the best in your endeavor as you try to be the numero uno in the southeastern state of Imo. thank you so much thank uh you. tony ajogu uh, governorship candidate on the platform of all a progressive grand alliance. Thanks again for joining us on the show. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. And that's it on the show today. Thank you so very much for being a part of it. We've been speaking to the governorship candidate of, on the platform of the all progressive grand alliance in Imo State in the coming uh, governorship elections on the 11th of November, 2023. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Victor Mathias. It's bye for now.